Hello, and welcome to another session of First Chapter Friday. My name is Kathy, and I'm a librarian at the Children's Library in Palo Alto. And every Friday, I read the first chapter of a book that you might like to finish yourself. Today's is a little different. Today's is called, My Name is Tani, and I Believe in Miracles. The amazing true story of one boy's journey from refugee to chess championship. And it's written by Tani Toruya Adiwumi, along with his parents, Coyote and Oluwaitoin Adiyumi, and with help from Craig Berlays. So, normally, I like to do fiction books. I, in fact, I prefer fiction books. But sometimes a nonfiction book will grab me either by the cover or its title or something about the character. And in this case, it was all three. Um, one thing about nonfiction books is usually you already know the end. In this case, we know he came, he was a refugee, and now he's a chess champion. So why read the book, right? Well, to find out how it happened, because it wasn't a straight path and it wasn't easy. So for this one, I'm going to read the prelude and then the first chapter. And I'm not going to read from the back or the inside cover because they're just excerpts from the book. So here we go. Prologue. My name is Tani, and my family says I like to ask a lot of questions. They're right. I like puzzles. I like riddles. I like trying to figure out why things happen and how things work. But things have been different lately. Instead of asking the questions, I've been the one trying to answer them. A lot of people have wanted to know all kinds of things about me and my life. They want to know what life was like for me and how I feel about the way things have changed. They want me to tell my story. And I want to tell it, but there's never enough time to say everything that's in my head. So this book is going to be my answer. But if I'm going to tell you my story, I need to start by saying that I don't remember much about Nigeria. I know that I was six years old when those really bad people called Boko Haram tried to kill my dad and we had to leave. But honestly, I was asleep most of the times they came looking for my dad, so you'd have to ask him about that. What I do remember about life in Nigeria is playing soccer and my brother Austin trying to teach me chess and how one day I was watching the news on the TV and there was this airplane pilot who had just done something amazing. He was Nigerian, like me, and there must have been a really serious problem with the plane because everyone was excited about the fact that he had landed safely and everyone survived. From that moment on, I wanted to be a pilot. It's not because of money, though. Being a pilot makes you rich, but I don't mean money rich. I like the idea of doing something like that to help people. I remember a lot about life in America, like how when we moved to New York, I learned about chess properly this time, and discovered that the very best players in the world are called Grand Masters. And so from then on, I started to think it might be a good idea to be a Grand Master too. And then one day, Coach Sean Martinez actually took me to meet Fabiano Caruana, who is the number two chess player in the whole world. He shook my hand and we talked. And from that moment on, I decided that I definitely wanted to be a grandmaster. And then something happened. I won a chess tournament. And lots and lots and lots of people wanted to talk to me. It wasn't just people from New York or even America. People from all over the world wanted to know my story. Some of them still do. A lot of the people I have spoken to ask me about chess. They say things like, how has chess changed your life? Or, what do you like most about playing chess? I mostly give them the same answer to both questions, which is that chess has taught me how to do deep thinking. Sometimes people laugh when they hear me say that, but I don't see how it's very funny. The more I think about all this, the more I know that I can't answer each, either of these questions quickly. I need a lot more than one minute to be able to explain everything. And I don't think I can do it all by myself because there's so much that I don't remember. So the best way to tell my story is to have my parents help me. 
They know all the details of everything that's happened, and they're also my heroes. None of this would have happened if it hadn't been for them. I would have asked Austin to help tell the story too, but he likes basketball a lot more than he likes writing. But he's still my hero as well. After I won the chess tournament and spoke to all those people, life changed really quickly for all of us. Recently, I've been thinking again about being a pilot. Since talking to everyone, I now know that there are a lot of places I've not been to, and if I were a pilot, maybe I could go see them. I could fly to China, Japan, Arizona, Kentucky, Turkey, and England. I want to go to these places and live there for maybe one whole year or maybe just five months. I read in a book that the average person lives to be 71 years old, but I think I'm not going to live the average. I think I'm going to live to be more than 100. So maybe I'll do both, be a grandmaster and a pilot too. I'd like that. I don't know what I'm going to be. My dad says that's okay. But I do know this much. I believe in miracles. Part one, when danger knocks. Chapter one, the day school closed early. Tani, he's the one who wrote this chapter. At first, I was happy when they sent us home from school early. I think I was in first grade and it was before Christmas time. What I know for sure is that after morning recess, the teachers told us school was done for the day and that we should leave. Wow, that was good news. You would have thought the teachers would have been happy about getting out of school early too, but they weren't. They all looked serious as they whispered together. They hurried us out into the yard and stood watching us, making sure we stayed behind the locked gates until our parents came to fetch us. Austin and I had to wait for ages until Mom came, but it didn't matter. We were still happy. Austin even let me sit next to him on the bench. When we got home, we played soccer in the courtyard with some friends. Soccer is not an easy game when you're little and you're playing your big brother and his friends who are way taller than you. And it's really hard when they don't pass you the ball, even though you stand on the side and wave your arms and shout over and over to them, Hey, pass me the ball. I'm over here. Pass it to me. Pass it. They just ignored me. I shouted louder, but they still ignored me. Then, even though I really didn't want to, I started to cry. I couldn't stop the tears. So that was when a really good day stopped being so good after all. I went inside and saw Mom. Granddad was there too. They both looked as serious as the teachers looked. I didn't like the fact that I was crying, but I was really upset about the soccer game. I told Mom about Austin and his friends not passing the ball to me, and she said she'd go speak to them, but she didn't. She just gave me a hug while she kept talking with Granddad about the school closing early. I was only half listening, but when Granddad asked, How long is it closed for? And Mom said, I don't know. I sat up. I asked, What do you mean? Is there school tomorrow? Mom shook her head and said, It's closed for a while, just until... She didn't finish her sentence. I didn't mind. I was running outside again, ready to tell the others this great news. The rest of the day was good, really good. Everyone was so happy about school being closed, and for a long time I played soccer, and they even passed the ball to me four times. I didn't score any goals, but it was still fun. Later, when my friends had gone and it had gotten dark and the power hadn't cut out for once, we were all in the living room. Austin was doing his homework, and Mom and Dad were watching the TV news. I didn't really like TV too much, so I was probably playing or reading or something like that. The man on TV said a word that made me stop whatever I was doing and listen. It was a word that I had heard for the first time earlier that day. When Dad quickly turned off the TV, I said, Dad, what's Boko Haram? He only looked at me for a really short time, and then the thing he did where he frowns and shakes his head. When he does that, it always reminds me of someone trying to shake a fly from his face without using his hands. He said, it is nothing that you need to worry about. Why do you ask? And I said, it's what the teachers were all talking about today before they sent us home. Is it like Christmas? Is that why they closed the school? He looked at mom, then back at me. He spoke in a very serious way. No, 
I tell you, Tani, this is not something you should worry about. And it's bedtime now. When Dad sends us to bed, there's no point arguing. So I went straight away. Whatever Boko Haram was, I liked it. Hopefully, there would be some more of it soon, so that we would get even more time off from school. And that's the end of chapter one. He got more time off from school, and a lot more besides. But you'll have to read the rest of the book to find out. If you are watching this during the summer, please make sure to sign up for summer reading. Everyone can join, ages 0 to 150, and everyone wins a prize. And also remember to check out the Palo Alto Library's events page to see what else we're doing this summer. Thank you for joining me for First Chapter Friday, and I'll be back again next week. Goodbye. Thank you.